I've been asked to do eight BBCs during this retreat, and they all happen to fall on a Sunday. And so I thought to do them on the eight verses of thought transformation. That's the recitation that we do after lunch every Sunday. And um, sometimes we may do recitations if we know them by heart while our mind is wandering elsewhere. I know I do that. Maybe others do as well. So I thought it might be helpful to yeah, focus back on these verses and what they mean. So I'll just share a few thoughts um, coming up in my mind about these eight verses. And if, in case anyone doesn't know where they can be found, they're in the Blue Prayer Book, the Pearl of Wisdom, Book 1, page 36. So these eight, this little text is in the genre called Lojong, or Thought Transformation. Um, developed in Tibet by followers of the Indian master, Atisha. So this particular text was written by um, a master named Langri Tangba, Geshe Langri Tangba. So verse number one says, <clears throat> With the thought of attaining awakening for the welfare of all beings who are more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel, I will constantly practice holding them dear. So what stands out for me in this verse is the idea of holding other beings as precious and dear. And I think everybody does that. Uh, I think <clears throat> we all have certain people, certain beings that we regard as precious and dear. Like if you're a parent, then your children are precious and dear. Um, other family members, friends, pets, if you're a pet owner. Um, so that kind of feeling just comes up naturally with regard to certain people and certain beings. But it's probably rare to find someone who regards all living beings <laughs> as precious and dear. And in fact, you know, there's many beings that we feel just the opposite to. You know, we wish they didn't exist. <laughs> so, but we can change that. We can work on that and gradually, slowly learn to see more and more people and beings as precious and dear, and eventually be able to feel that way towards all living beings. Now, why should we do that? Well, we can't get enlightened if we don't. <laughs> There's no way to reach awakening which we have the potential to attain, if we don't have this attitude towards all living beings without exception. But it also brings a lot of benefit in this life. Um, if you look at what happens when we don't have that feeling towards somebody, and if we feel the opposite, like if we feel anger and hatred and aversion, it's really disturbing and painful and creates a lot of problems both in ourselves and also in our relationships and for others. So there's a lot of benefit if we can open up our hearts and see more and more people and beings as precious and dear. So how we can do this is by using different reasons. So one is um, because we depend on others for our own happiness. So there's a lot of teachings about this, but just briefly, um, everything we own, use, enjoy comes from others, even our body. We wouldn't have this body if it weren't for our parents and all the people who produced food that kept us alive all, all this time and continues keeping us alive day to day. So that's just one example. But the same goes for clothing, shelter, entertainment, medicine, um, and the basic things we have in life, like electricity and water and gas and roads to drive on and trains and planes to travel on and so on. So everything in our life comes from others. And that doesn't apply only to this life, but also to our past lives. So if we had total recall of everything we've ever experienced in all our previous lives, and our interactions with others, we would be able to see that we have benefited from 
the work, the kindness, the help of all other living beings. And not only that, they're also necessary for our achievement of happiness, for our experience of happiness. Um, because according to Buddhism, happiness, the cause of happiness is virtue such as practicing giving, generosity, ethics, patience, and so on. So having good attitudes and doing good deeds. And for many of the good attitudes and good deeds that we engage in, we need others as objects, as recipients, like to give, to be generous and give. There needs to be others who need things that we can give them to. Um, so we can't practice giving without others. And the same with ethics and even patience. Um, when it comes to the really difficult people, we tend to think, oh, they're just a hassle. They just make trouble for me. They're not helpful at all. But patience is a really, really important quality. We need it. It's, 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 it teaches us how to overcome anger, how to manage anger. And we need our patience to be tested. Yeah, when we're with nice people, easy people, easygoing people, yeah, we feel, oh, I'm really patient. I don't have any anger. But then when we encounter someone who's really annoying and irritating and does things we don't like, then poof, anger comes up. And then we get a chance to see, oh, we're not so patient as we thought. We still have anger. We need to work on that. So the Buddha said um, uh, difficult people like enemies are our greatest teachers. They, they teach us where we're at in terms of anger versus patience and give us a chance to increase patience. And in that way, we can um, have more of that quality, which is very, very beautiful and fulfilling and satisfying. But it's also one of the causes for progressing along the path and eventually reaching enlightenment. So to create virtue and to follow the path, progress along the path, we need other people, other beings, in relation to whom we do these practices. So you could spend a lot of time contemplating that, and, and especially with the difficult people, difficult beings, and come to see that, yeah, I wouldn't be able to be happy without them. Another reason is that everybody has Buddha nature. Every living being has um, the potential to transform themselves become free of all their afflictions, their negative states of mind, negative behavior, and eventually become fully enlightened Buddha. So every being is a potential Buddha. And that takes time to think about, to contemplate, to get um, familiar with and be able to accept. But that's another way to rec recognize that every being is precious. It's like there's a jewel, a really, really precious jewel hidden inside each and every sentient being, even the ones who are really deluded and really doing awful things. But that's not their real nature. That's only because of ignorance and other afflictions. But hidden inside of them is this precious Buddha nature. And the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are working continuously, trying to help us wake up to our Buddha nature, bring it out, make it manifest so that we can all become Buddhas. So that's something else to contemplate, to recognize the preciousness of sentient beings. Another point is that they are precious and dear to the Buddha. And the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas regard every living being as precious. So not long ago, Geshe uh, Dado, Geshe Chodok, shared with us this um, sutra or part of a sutra called the Soda Saltwater Sutra, um, in which the Buddha talks about how he attained enlightenment, became what he became with all these four kayas of, a, of an enlightened being. He did this for the sake of sentient beings. Yeah? So all the work that he did to follow the path and achieve enlightenment, he did this for others. And therefore, he says, whoever benefits sentient beings, even in a small way, would make a genuine offering to me. And he said the opposite with whoever harms any sentient being, um, even if they're making offerings to me, it's not a genuine offering because of this negative attitude they have towards sentient beings. 
for whom the Buddha, uh, in, 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 um, sorry, <laughs> in the Buddha's eyes, those sentient beings are dear and precious. They have nothing but love and compassion for them. So any harm we do to sentient beings is like harming the Buddhas. It's like, you know, slapping the Buddhas in the face. So that's really powerful to think of as well. So then if you think about a sentient being that you find annoying and irritating, and maybe even you hate them, <laughs> and then you think, well, how, how does a sentient being appear to the Buddha? How does the Buddha regard this being? We can't know for sure, but in this sutra, the Buddha is saying, I care about each and every one of them. Each and every one of them is dear to me. So you have these two different perspectives on that one being, yours and the Buddha's. Which one is right? <laughs> you think you're, you, you see things more accurately than the Buddha? <laughs> Your view is more correct than the Buddha's? Yeah, maybe not. So some people might think, but do we really need reasons? in order to have love and compassion and concern for sentient beings? Why not just have unconditional love and compassion for them? I mean, if you can do that, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. Just because they exist, just because they are beings, and they want to be happy and they don't want to suffer just like me. So just on that alone, you may be able to feel concern and love and compassion for them. Just yesterday I read about this woman in Israel who had started a, um, some kind of organization called the Road to Recovery, and she and other volunteers would go into places like Gaza and the West Bank and bring children who were ill or injured into Israel to get good medical care. And they had to stop, she'd been doing that for many years. They had to stop recently because of the war. But now she's, she's doing it in the West Bank. She's able to go in and out of there and bring, bring kids to hospitals. But she said a lot of people are just so opposed to what she's doing. You know, even, she said even people on the left are saying things like, we should just totally demolish Gaza. So there's just a huge amount of anger and hatred towards the, the Palestinians and not much support for what she's doing. <laughs> but she's still doing it because she says people are people. Yeah, human beings are human beings, no matter what their nationality is. And if they need help, she wants to help them. So, so there are people who are able to have that kind of attitude, even towards the so-called enemies, um, people who do harmful things. Um, so those are just some reasons that can be used to generate this feeling of sentient beings being dear and precious. And it does take time, it does take effort to work on this. But like I say, if you can see the benefits of it, both the long-term benefit, like reaching enlightenment, progressing along the path, but also the short-term benefit, just being more happy and peaceful in this life, getting along better with others, having less anger and hatred in our minds. So, yeah. It's worth doing.